everyone. Welcome to our webinar in which this week we are going to be talking and discussing about motherhood. And together with me is Pamela Andrew. So before we go on further, let me just introduce myself and also introduce uh, my friend here, Pam. Uh, so I am Farah Azlin and I will be moderating and asking a few questions in regards to the topic that we are discussing today, which is on motherhood. And um, with me here is Dr. Pamela Andrew, who is our clinical psychologist in Nallery and is also practicing as a lecturer, right, Pam? Huh? Yes, right, correct. Cool. So let's just jump into this, um, this topic on motherhood. So maybe, Pam, if you can share with us here, like, because when we talk about being a parent, right, being a parent, being a mother or being a father, there are... I'm sure there's a lot of experience, a lot of things that's going on through our mind. So perhaps if you can share just a bit of like share with us in terms of how, what exactly is the experience when it comes to being a parent or entering parenthood or motherhood? Yeah, thank you so much, Farah. I think, um, I think this is a really good and very important topic because a lot of people are actually going into motherhood and some of them are prepared, but not everyone is actually fully aware or really prepared about the current situations that they'll be facing once they delve into becoming um, someone who's pregnant or and then becoming a parent. So what I can see when, whenever I give talks to women who are pregnant, right? So what I can notice is that usually the experience of becoming a parent, it starts the moment the, the, the mom is pregnant. And then nowadays they would say uh, we are pregnant as in the husband and the wife are both pregnant. So they're, I mean, they're both having a baby in a way you can say. So they're both becoming parents already from that moment. Now, usually from that moment, the feeling of elation is there. The feeling of joy is there. They feel so empowered and they feel almost almost invincible. They feel like, I'm a parent. Yes, I've been waiting for this. But also, together with that comes a lot of fear. There's also a lot of fear. There's also a lot of nervousness. There's mixed feelings. And some mothers or also daddies-to-be, they feel just fear. So you can have three conditions. One is total joy and peace and excitement and gratitude. One is complete fear and freaking out kind of panic feelings and the other one is uh, both mixed feelings so they can have a, a mixture of both and interestingly Farah to see that right what happens in a mom when she first gets pregnant in the first trimester a mom would experience a surge of in the rise of hormones that happens in, in her body and that can actually cause a lot of hormonal differences happening which can have a very direct influence on her emotions and when that happens, that's what causes the very common mood swings that we see in a lot of pregnant women in the first three months, usually. And then this is followed by a second trimester, which usually kind of calms down a little bit. It kind of, the, the hormones and everything and emotions have kind of adjusted and are in sync a little bit more. And then in the third trimester, when the mom is preparing for birth uh, in the towards the eighth month and the ninth month, you can see that the hormones and the mood swings also can be a little bit more apparent as well. So there are a lot of things like this that a mom can actually prepare for, also the dads to be as well. Yeah, so that's what um, I think the preparation can actually entail. I see. So, so actually, of course, at the start of pregnancy, there will be midst of emotions like you shared. There will be like joy and there also will be fear and mix of both. And along, along like the pregnancy, there are times where you mentioned the hormonal change. It will be very, very prominent in, in amongst the mom, right? Um, so, so you're saying in each phase of the pregnancy, there will be different uh, experience going through by the mom. And I think we've, we've also heard of uh, what we call as postpartum, like postnatal. Yes. There's also another thing that happened where I think you would know best in, in terms of sharing with us on what's going to happen then. Like you mentioned, okay, during pregnancy, these are the things that the mothers and the father will go through. What about the postpartum, the postnatal that experience? How would that be? Okay, so it's actually very good that you brought that up also, Farah, because a lot of people are kind of confused about what is the difference between um, postpartum and also the normal kind of reaction that um, a new mom would 
definitely feel, right? So it's, it's understandable. So that is actually called baby blues, the one where you would classify the reactions and the symptoms and the emotions as normal and um, kind of understandable at a, at a very normal level. But when it becomes a little bit more severe and it's moving towards clinical, then we would term it as postpartum. So can I, I would just like to share with you a little bit about that. So if you can see the normal reactions that a mom would normally go through usually happens um, at the stage where the first two days after delivery, now, this is actually called baby blues, okay? So first of two or three days after delivery, and then it can last up to two weeks. So if it's lasting a lot longer than two weeks, then three weeks, then four weeks, a month has passed by, she's still having those symptoms, and we can see the severity increasing. These are red flags for the husbands also to look out for, also for loved ones, family, friends, anyone. So let me share with you a little bit of the common symptoms that we can see in baby blues, which is the one that I was sharing with you that usually starts about two to three days after delivery, which lasts for about two weeks, right? So the common symptoms are mood irritability. Okay, she just gave birth. She's feeling tired. She's probably feeling, you know, excited, but also afraid. And she's exhausted. She just went through some pain. And, and you know, there's a lot of things that she's going through. There can be mood irritability, sleep disturbance. Of course, this can also be related to the hormones. There can be poor appetite. There can be loneliness. She can feel really afraid and lonely, you know, like going through this experience. She might be faced with a situation where she's not prepared to be alone with the baby. Um, she might feel weepy without reason, you know, like feeling like she wants to cry without reason. This can also be the hormone hormonal changes. These are normal responses um, to hormonal changes after childbirth. But how do we know if it's clinical and it's not normal and hey, I think there's something to be of concern here. Now, this is when it becomes more severe. It's more long-lasting. It's a long-lasting form of depression. It's called postpartum depression, PPD. Now, this can actually be an extreme mood disorder if we don't intervene at the right time. But this is not to be um, of alarming right now because it is not to say that it cannot be helped, it cannot be intervened, it can. In fact, it, it, some research has even shown that it is one of the types of depressive symptoms that can be intervened quite promptly. It can also be intervened in a more a very effective way. It can be helped to be resolved even faster than some other depressive symptoms. So that's the good news for that. But getting early intervention is very important. So let me share with you a little bit about this. So this one mimics a little bit of baby blues, but instead of um, having just the common symptoms that we shared just now, they have a little bit more of inadequacy, hopelessness, worthlessness, there's a lack of energy, there's a lack of sex drive, there's fear of being alone, they feel significant appetite changes, significant sleep changes and weight changes as well. And the mood irritability is extreme. And it usually develops in, within the first few weeks after giving birth. It can begin earlier, like during pregnancy. It can even begin during pregnancy, but it can it, then it can last up to a year after birth even. So it can really interfere with the mom's um, it, you know, ability to care for the baby. But let me share with you a very simple way to know when is it severe? When is it actually clinical? Okay, there are four important things that I find very useful to think about it in this way. Okay, so the first one is the severity level. Is it very severe um is it lasting you know like the symptoms are much more it's not just irritability it's extreme irritability it's not just weight changes sleep changes it's very significant already like the mom can't sleep and can't function like that so the duration is also very important is it two weeks is it three weeks is it a month then it, you you can know that there's of concern because baby blues the regular common normal duration is two weeks so if it's longer than that, it is good for us to real recognize the red flag and try to intervene. Frequency is also very important. How often is the mom experiencing these symptoms within a day? Is it every moment of the day? Is it once a week? Or is it every day for two weeks? The functioning is also very important, which means that is it affecting her daily functioning? Is she now not able to function anymore? Is she finding it difficult to care for her baby and 
be her normal self again. So there are four main things, severity, duration, frequency, and functioning. So when we look at it in this way, we can kind of differentiate between the normal reaction and a clinical reaction in that sense. Yeah, so I think that's something helpful for us to remember. I see. Thank you so much, uh, Pam, for sharing that with us. I think it's quite clear how you explain the difference between baby blues and then postpartum depression. And I think what the, the things that I got from what you share is the four main things when it comes to like how are we going to differentiate between whether this is just a normal thing. Because like you said, baby blues is a normal thing a mom will experience after, uh, after giving birth. And then there's also the more severe part. And so the first one is actually the duration, to like to know how long, how long have you been experiencing it, and then the frequency of it, right? The frequency of the the symptoms that you're going through. Is it frequent? Is it most of the time? And then the third one in terms of functionality, whether you can perform your daily activities or is very difficult for you to perform your daily activities. And lastly, you mentioned just now, is on uh whether or not um it's whether or not like the du the duration is affecting and the severity in terms of the symptoms all the symptoms that you're going through right so these four things exactly. severity duration frequency and also functioning functioning yeah yeah so um so we talk about this how it affects the mother what about fathers then how would then you know, going through this affecting the father. Yeah, actually, that's um, that's something that's overlooked a lot, you know, Farah. I, I like that you asked that question because fathers are not exempted from this as well. There's something that is called as paternal postpartum depression. So paternal postpartum depression is postpartum depression that can also happen to men. It can. I actually know a case where um, the father actually experienced morning sickness when the mom was um, in the first trimester and at first people thought that it was kind of cute and it's funny and it, it looks so adorable and everything but actually he was experiencing um, some emotional symptoms that were exhibiting and manifesting itself physiologically he was already having some anxiety and uh, fear and panic he would he also had a lot of financial issues and he had so many other related issues to feel that way and the main issue to be of concern right now is that it started to go into depressive symptoms when we look at it and then when you see that you can see that he was becoming more isolated and usually men can experience it in a different way like I think if we look at the majority of cases based on my experience as well, and also based on research, women tend to be a bit more expressive in their emotions through verbal, verbal kind of like, um, you know, expressions, right? But men, sometimes they, they may not exactly be as verbal as women or vocal about it and wanting to actually reach out and seek help about it, unless they actually have a very good support system in their own, having their own friends, you know, or family members who are available for them. Otherwise, they tend to isolate and then they tend to withdraw. And in the case that I'm sharing with you, the person tend to, was actually withdrawing and in the end, he actually took off and he you can say literally ran away. So that was very sad to see what happened. And you, it is safe to say that the symptoms kind of look similar and are in line with postpartum depression for men. That is why it's so important for us to also realize the, the red flags that can occur in men as well. It's something to be on, of concern about, you know, because they can also experience depressive symptoms. And usually the way they express it out is in isolation and withdraw, withdrawing away. So then we can recognize that, okay, this is a red flag. I think I need to reach out to this person. So wives as well, you can also look out for those symptoms in your husband. So it's something very normal. You can see that they can feel overwhelmed, sad, fatigued. They feel anxious. They don't even want to see the baby sometimes. Maybe that can be a sign as well. They're not even interested to know um, the sex of the baby after the baby is born. It can, all these are some signs. Unusual eating and sleeping patterns, um, loss of libido as well can be. They, it's kind of sim similar to the symptoms of mothers as well. It can be. So 
Um, very also common and very inter interesting also for us to know, right, Farah, is also um, coming back to also the melan the you know the, the postpartum depression for women and also now talking about the postpartum depression for men, there's a checklist actually that we need to also take into consideration. There's something called a mom's melancholy. So I don't know if this can also apply for the dads because it says in the checklist, sometimes after having a baby, we can forget about a lot of important things in our life as well. Like, are you hydrated? This is the checklist. Are you actually hydrated? Are you dressed? Have you eaten? Have you showered? Have you connected with a friend today? Have you snuggled your child today? Have you given a hug or received a hug from your baby or your spouse? Okay. Um, have you connected spiritually today? So sometimes when you go through the checklist, if there's a lot of it that you have not done yet, it is safe to say that it could be a melancholy situation. And perhaps after you get these checklists done, you can check yourself again and see, am I still feeling the same way? Because let's face it, if we don't do these basic necessities in our life, in our daily activities, sometimes it also puts us off in a very difficult mood as well sometimes. So it's very good for us to go through this checklist also, just to be sure, so that we kind of rule out, you know, knowing that is it just because of these that I haven't done this yet? So we can rule that out for a bit, a little bit as well. Yeah, so I think that those are the main things about that. Great, and this is the first time actually I hear about this mother's melancholy checklist. And I think it's such yeah. a cool thing, and not just for the mother, but also for the father to also, you know, keep check, not just like, okay, we're focusing on the mothers only, keep check on both, because both like father and mother is going through a transition, right? Having a newborn. So of course, the experience will be a bit different than how it was before when you don't have a baby in the family, right? Um. And the key thing I think here is also the checklist is also helpful for us to be mindful of our surroundings. Because, you know, sometimes we can be overwhelmed, like we can be overwhelmed with many things, new baby, I have to, I need to take care of the house and maybe work comes in suddenly, for example. So um, being mindful on the things that we have to do at that moment with this checklist will be very, very helpful for both mother and father. Um, so yeah, um, Pam, I would like to ask you as well, um, you mentioned just now about, um, you know, people having baby blues and maybe uh, towards the severe part may develop into postpartum depression. And it shows how um, early intervention is very, very important. Right? So, so how, what would you suggest for our viewers here to, you know, when it comes to days like being prepared and what can they do when they're experiencing the symptoms or the situation? Um, yeah, thank you so much, Farah, because actually, you know what? If we don't intervene earlier, it can actually become more severe. And there are some cases where it's not just postpartum depression, it's postpartum psychosis even. So postpartum psychosis is when, you know, it becomes so severe that there's hallucinations and delusions. You know how when we hear about moms feeling like they want to throw the baby out of the window, they actually feel like they can almost hear a voice telling them to just end that, you know, and do that, carry out that particular action. So that is a little bit of postpartum psychosis. But the most common one is postpartum depression. And if we intervene early, we can actually get it at the baby blue stage before it goes into a clinical disorder. So if we don't intervene early, we are concerned. Actually, there's a, there's a bit of a concern if it can affect the baby as well, because sometimes um, this is when during pregnancy, the one that I'm sharing with you now is during pregnancy, because that can also come during pregnancy. So with the mom's hormones, whenever there's any kinds of changes in the hormones, especially when she's stressed, the cortisol level of hormones that rise in the mom's body can actually affect the baby's cortisol levels and cause a lot of effects on the baby, psychological functioning in later adulthood as well. And besides that, it can also cause the telomeres. There's something called telomeres. It's very interesting if you look this up. It's a, actually a protective casing at the end of our chromosomes. It's called telomeres. And it's at the end of our strand of DNA. It's actually something that is very responsible for our longevity, for our um, aging process, and for our health. In, in general. So when we're stressed, it causes that 
protective casing to shorten and shorten. It speeds up the aging when that shortens. And it's really dangerous for people, actually. So now coming to your question of like, how can we help everyone to prepare better and to, you know, be able to function better, right? So I would like everyone, I actually heard this by a very wonderful psychologist as well. And I want to share with you that this is a wonderful way for us to view things. Can you imagine your mind as a rubber band? And now a rubber band is actually very capable of being flexible. So you can actually stretch it more than you know and than you think. But if we keep stretching without actually giving it a break, it can snap. So that is the part where we need to really take care and be careful. So flexibility is important, but taking care of it is very important to make sure that we don't overburden and overwhelm ourselves. So how can we actually um, help to really intervene and really be able to have a nice way for us to, you know, cope with this. So I have this very nice thing that I have actually prepared for the mothers that I usually share with them. And I would love to share that with you, Farah, and also those of them who are actually listening, listening in. We are from Naluri. So came up with this very nice acronym here. It starts with N-A-L-U-R-I. So that's N for nutrition. As in, the first thing that you need to do in taking care of your mental well-being is not only immediately targeting your emotions, but not forgetting about your bodily needs and also your physiological symptoms and also, so in other words, your nutrition. And the A would be active lifestyle, L would be love, and U would be upward spiral theory, and I would be identity. So can I actually share a little bit about this, Farah, and um, to share with you a little bit about the acronym? Okay, so yes, how it, it. thank you, Farah. So how it goes is like this. Nutrition. So what we can do right now, which I've also heard many nutritionists tell the pregnant moms, is that you know we can actually help our moods and our emotions more than we know, actually, more than we are aware of. Physiologically, there are certain kinds of foods that help to boost our moods. I think that's worth trying, right? There are, there are four hormones in our body, right? We have serotonin, we have oxytocin, um, we have dopamine, and we also have, um, so what was that again for? Okay, we have oxytocin, dopamine, adrenaline, right? Am I right? And endorphins, right? So we have these four hormones in our body. Now, serotonin is something that is definitely very, very boosted by a lot of different kinds of foods that you can eat to help yourself. There are certain kinds of foods that you can help um, by, for example, spinach, um, milk, nuts, and chocolate. But this is not to say that you bulk up on that and you know make sure you always check with your doctor, of course, before doing that. But it's just to help you know that there are certain kinds of foods that are very important that can help you physio physiologically, but also emotionally. And remember, pregnant moms always have this complaint towards me as well constipation was one of the concerns that they were facing so sometimes remember a happy bowel system can also affect your mood so a happy stomach happy tummy happy bowel system all of these things can really regulate in our body and really affect how we feel so nutrition is something that will definitely cause a domino effect on every other part physiologically now for the a we have here activity all right, so for activity, it's physical activity. It's very important for everyone in general. And even so for moms as well, to really regulate and their blood circulation and to help them with their moods as well. So now a very important and interesting research, right, Farah, it showed that when they did a trial run or a clinical trial, a kind of experimental trial with people who were having depressive symptoms, they found that when they gave them three types of interventions okay the first one was purely exercise intervention the second one was purely medication the third one was a combination of exercise plus medication they found that the group that actually improved significantly in their moods was actually the one would you like to guess Farah? <laughs> would you like to see which one was was it the one which was exercise or the one with exercise and medication, or the one that was only medication? What do you think? Hmm, I can guess. 
<laughs> just take a guess it's okay <laughs> one with um active lifestyle like exercise and also medication okay that's what i thought too far that's exactly okay. what i would th have thought as well right mm -hmm. but turns out nah it was not it was actually the one with um purely exercise you know now that would actually surprised me a lot. This is not to say that medication is not important. No, it does not mean that at all. It just so happens that in this study, this is what they found in their trial. So I was actually surprised as well. But I guess in, it depends on the person as well. But one key takeaway point that we can see is never underestimate the power of exercise, right? So actually, exercise can be very powerful. Of course, it may not be the solution for everyone. In this trial, it was only generalized for only this population that they did the experiment on. But it's very interesting to see the results. And I felt that when I actually recommend this to my clients who have depressive symptoms, and I see the results, it was very interesting to see that happening. So we, it's a very good preventive method, I feel, that we can start doing today. So activity, everyone, let's start that today. L, now L is actually love, right? <laughs> so love stands for self-love or we need to love ourselves. That is something that is very lacking in a lot of people nowadays. So love is very important, not just loving other people, not just loving your baby, but loving yourself as the mom. Because if you don't feel 100%, then you can't give your spouse or your baby or everyone around you 100%. So you deserve to love yourself and be compassionate to yourself. When you're tired, rest. When you're sleepy, sleep. When you're hungry, you deserve to eat. If you just don't have the mood to do something, it's okay to say no. And also having forgiveness is important. Forgive yourself for anything that you have done. If you are, don't beat yourself up about it. No one is a perfect parent. It's okay for us to give out the, ourselves the space to learn and grow. No one is perfect. We are not perfect children as well to our parents. Our parents are not perfect as well. No one is perfect, but we all grow in the process of it. Now, also another L is love for your partner. Because remember, this is your partnership. And um, this is kind of like a partnership and your partner in crime, just so to say. And this is something that you are not doing alone. And you really need each other's support so, so much. So empathize with yourself, empathize with each other, and remember that this is a partnership. Now, U, U stands for upward spiral theory. So this is a very nice theory in positive psychology I want to share with you. It says that positive effect is experienced during a new health behavior. So that is why it links back to our activity just now, physical activity, when, or any other health behavior is fine. Even if it means um, doing mindfulness, meditation, prayer, or even you know having a very nice walk in your garden. So positive emotion is experienced when you perform a new health behavior. And when you experience it as an experience that is pleasant, the likelihood of you maintaining it is gonna be very, very high. So then you're going to continue doing it. And, it's, and that's going to be an upward spiral, remember? So what is the spiral? Think about it as an upward domino effect. When you start off with one positive behavior, you're going to feel so excited for the next behavior. And you're going to be excited about the next moment and the next moment and the next moment. So how you start your day is important. Even if you start your day wrong, it's not too late. It doesn't mean your whole day is ruined. You can still do something to kind of like create this upward spiral. So just start with something that makes you happy. I like starting my day with a really nice cup of um, hot drink, anything that you like. If you can take, um, you know, anything according to what your doctor also shares with you to take according to your pregnancy. So as a mom, you know, depending on the whether uh, you're breastfeeding also, they'll be depending on what kind of suitable drinks will be available for you as well. Like for me right now, I, I find taking having a nice cup of coffee or um, tea or anything that, that, that is delicious, like and yummy hot chocolate for me and with some music, I love starting my morning in that way. And also putting my phone away actually helps me very much in the morning, especially. And opening the windows and looking outside at the greenery, which is why I actually position my table facing the window because I love doing that so much. So that makes me so motivated and happy. And when you feel happy 
in vibes and happy emotions, remember the happy hormones, you're going to have this surge of endorphin release in yourself. And when you have that, you're going to be motivated to do more things happily in your day. So that's going to be very helpful. Now coming to the R, okay. So the R is the resilient mindset. So this one means our mind is very important, the way we think. So remember, there's something called um, cognitive reframing. Okay, so there is a model, if you want to actually look it up in psychology, it's called the cognitive behavioral um, therapy approach. So this CBT approach actually is very interesting. And the reason it is so interesting is because it is kind of cyclical. It says it's like a, it, if you look at the arrows in this cycle, it's a dual arrow, which means that our thoughts, which is the top part, can affect and create our emotions. Our emotions can affect our behavior. And in turn, behavior can also affect our thoughts. So it's all a cyclical kind of a model right now happening. And that is why it's very important how we think. If we think that we are a failure, if we think that we're not lovable, then it will affect how you feel. And when you feel, of course, you would feel sad. If your thought is, I'm unlovable, I don't deserve to, to be, um, to have this child, I, I'm not a good mom. That's going to create emotions that are feeling like a failure. You're going to feel worthless, you're going to feel sad. And then your behavior might be, you feel like it's so difficult to get out of bed. It's so difficult to do anything, so difficult to function. So what we can do is we can start by changing those thoughts, by reframing those thoughts. A very good technique that I find so helpful is the yes but technique, which I help my clients with as well, and they find it very helpful as well. It starts off like this. You can say to yourself, yes, I may not be a perfect mom, but it doesn't mean that I'm a failure, but it doesn't mean that I'm a bad person. No one is perfect. There's always room for learning and growth. Things will get better. You can say that, and then the moment you say that, something wonderful happens. Your emotions start to change. Think about the last time you felt angry. What was in your mind? Did you actually feel that, um, did you actually believe those negative thoughts that you were having? Or did, what would happen if you changed those negative thoughts? Would it actually change your emotions? So that's something very interesting for you to explore. Now coming to the last part, yeah, it's the I. Now the I is actually very interesting. It talks about identity. For identity, um, the part that I like is actually that Sometimes we label ourselves in a very different ways that can really affect how we feel. So what do you actually think about yourself? Like, because that will affect how you speak to yourself every day. Without us realizing, we are speaking to ourselves every day, inside, internally. We're having this internal dialogue, positive self-talk, internally. Like when you don't do something, it's like, I can't believe I did this. I can't believe I missed this. I can't believe I forgot to check this, you know, that's already an internal dialogue. But what if we actually be more mindful of our internal dialogue? Because this can really represent our identity. What if we are more careful with the things that we say to ourselves, the positive self-talk? What if we say to ourselves, yes, I didn't do this, but it's okay. I'm going to be fine. I can, I can always improve myself. I can still learn how to do this. I am a good mom. I am a good wife. I am capable. The moment you start to say that, something happens within your body. Like physiologically and the chemical balance and everything and the, and the hormones in your body starts to actually change. And you start to feel this release in calmness, which is actually a lot of the hormones, endorphins. And, you know, a lot of this is actually being produced in your body. And you feel happier when you hear these kinds of nice thoughts happening. So that is very important for us, the way we talk to ourselves. Yeah, that's what I'd like to share. Wow. I feel like, wow. <laughs> because how I really love how you come up with all these techniques or how what you can do um, using this NALURI acronym. So if I got it right, so and it's for nutrition, which is very, very important. We still need to um, make sure that our bodily needs is, fat, is well fed. That's the most important thing. And then secondly is in terms of activity 
keep our body moving and don't just like stay you know because once you just stay in and you don't do anything that's when all of this thought starts to come in and they're making you feel overwhelmed so that's a and then l is for love self love love for your partner that's very very important and then you i think this one is very interesting upward spiral theory okay it sounds so fancy but it's just more like having a positive start having a positive attitude that like you say like like the domino effects like once you start your things with that positivity it will also affect the rest of your day and then next one is a resilient mindset and i think when it comes to resilient most of us we've heard a lot about resilience so it's, it shows like how important it is to have a resilient mindset and lastly is the identity how you view yourself is very important and i think the identity is so nice how you wrap it up with the identity because it's kind of like sum up everything that, that we talked about earlier on you know So yeah, this is very very comprehensive, and I hope it's much easier for everyone to understand as well, and also to remember Naluri, which is all the things that we talk about. Um, so I think we we are about to end this this discussion here, and I'm sure our viewers and even some of us who's listening to this, um, not everyone is a parent, or maybe yet to become a parent. So. When we listen to this, of course, for me, if I'm listening to this, I'm going to feel like, okay, so what can I do as someone who is not a parent or not yet a parent? How can I contribute or help? So maybe Pam, if you can share with us how then those maybe singles out there or those who are yet to become a parent, how can they, what can they do or how can they help for themselves or anyone that may have gone through this experience? Okay. Um, I think that's, um, that's actually very caring and very nice question because how can we help others who might be going through this right and also how can we help prepare ourselves as well if we have not actually um, become a parent yet so i think it's good for us to ask ourselves like um, have my motherly or fatherly instincts kicked in and how do i feel right now am i ready to be a parent and if i uh, if i was a parent what kind of parent would i be i think a lot of us have had such thoughts right so i think it's good for us to know that And then also maybe to read up on pregnancy and also read up on parenting to really do early preparation. And if you are someone who is uh, planning to really get married soon and also have a, a, a child soon, I think starting to visualize that happening was very, very important and very interesting because when we start to visualize, it actually kind of becomes very Um, it's very powerful. It's very important as well because visualization is something that taps on a part in our brain that is called the reticular activating system. So this system actually does not recognize an actual memory that has actually taken place or a thought that we are just imagining that hasn't taken place yet or a real event you know, that has already taken place. So our brain cannot differentiate that. The moment we think about something, it interprets it as real. So then it sends a signal to your emotions and your body to go and get that. So that's the important thing about how visualization works scientifically. So I think for all these new parents to be, so you can start visualizing yourself being a parent and how calm and confident and how collected you would be and how you'd be able to cope really well and how you'd be able to face the whole situation, how you and your partner will be so happily parenting together. I think that's a very nice picture to put in your mind from now. And then as As for helping out others who are going through this, I think singles and everyone um, who wants to help out their friends, they can actually try to notice the red flags in their friends. Are they actually experiencing depressive symptoms? Are they having this isolation situation? So then they can reach out to them and try to offer some help. Because I think sometimes a very common um, reaction is isolating and withdrawing. So I think that's a very nice picture for everyone, parents to be, to put in your mind to prepare. Cool. I guess that is a nice way to end our discussion. Um, it's not not just for the mothers. Like the preparation is not just for the mothers and fathers, but also for everyone because we live in a society and everyone do experience different things. And the key point here is to connect and also be empathy, have the empathy to, to, to people around us. Cool. I guess this is, uh, this is a very good discussion. Thank you so much, Pam, for your time and explaining. I think it's very thorough and very comprehensive. And I hope the audience as well, you, um, everyone got something from today's discussion and, um, 
thank you so much for tuning in and for watching us. Thank you, Farah. Thank you so much, everyone.